Thank you for the warm introduction. It's Saugeen, it's a hard G. Almost, almost. Um, we're gonna start with some introductions and then hop into our presentation. I'd first like to say miigwech for being such gracious host. You have a beautiful country and lands here. It's uh, really awe-inspiring. Miigwech in our language is, is thank you. Uh, Ani, Alex Duncan, Indigena Kaz, Wabjeshi, Indodem, Neashingming, Donjaba, Anishinaabe, Nini, Minogijib. Uh, in our culture, it's customary to introduce yourself, so I said hello. My name is Alex Duncan. My Ojibwe name is Nagan Wewe Don, which means uh, the forthcoming sound of thunder. I was given that by an elder. <laughs> yeah, make some noise. Um, and then I, I introduce my clan, so that's my family, Martin clan, and then where I'm from, Neashingaming, also known as the Chippewas Nawash. Um, I've been in fisheries for quite some time. I'm currently doing a PhD out in Vancouver, British Columbia, so long ways from home, but I'm near the end and, I, and I'm, uh, I'm coming home. So I'll uh, pass it over to, to Ryan to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's Ryan Lozon. And uh, how did I get here? Well, in 2008, I applied to a job and uh, found myself in front of chief and council and they drilled me with a whole bunch of questions. Uh, I'm not from Daywash. It was a completely new experience for me. And uh, I went out of that thinking that was the worst uh, interview of my life. And somehow here I am. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I came in the position, I was uh, just, a, you know, I had a bachelor of science degree. I liked to fish. But uh, coming into that position, uh, it was quite a learning experience. And I, I'm happy to say that I have one of my, my teachers here, uh, Nick, and uh, along with many of the other fishers that uh, really taught me most of what I, I know today. So I just wanted to say thank you to, uh, for inviting me here today. And we're going to share a little bit about some of our experiences. Ani Boju, Mukos Indigenous Kazmak Wai Rodam, Nyashing and Mingjondraba. I just wanted to uh, say that um, my name, my Indian name is uh, Little Bear, and I'm with from the Bear Clan, and I come from the beautiful community of Nyashing otherwise known as the Chippewas and Nawash. I'm not a master's student, I'm not a student uh, that has gone to university. I was uh, raised, unfortunately, in foster care and uh, am a part of that colonialism and was taken away from my family. It wasn't until I was 22 years old when I met my family and started to get to uh, understand my roots as a, of a culture, as a tradition, and even as a fisherman and currently as a sitting councillor in our community. I uh, say great thanks to the organizers of this event and for inviting us and having us come over here. Um, this is my first time on a big plane and uh, coming across uh, this long of a tour, it was 40 hours um, to get here. And uh, I really do appreciate the hospitality that you have all shown over here. Uh, on that note, I am gonna turn it back over to uh, Alex. I uh, think the world of Alex as a, as a nephew He's uh, a very inspiring young person who is learning our culture uh, as well as uh, putting the PhD to understanding what it is that we talk about in traditional knowledge. Miigwech. All right, so um, yeah, we're gonna talk about some of the research we're doing in our community and this idea of Wasindame, which in our language means to walk together. Um, I'm going to give a bit of a primer for Canada, as we're not from here. Uh, this is a really cool map on native-land.ca. Uh, it, it, it provides a, a map of all of the indigenous territories. These are the larger uh, language-speaking groups. And I do have a pointer. Down in the bottom right there, that's the Great Lakes. That's where we come from. And our people are Ojibwe or Anishinaabe. And in the language, that means the original people. It's a, cool, it's a cool website, you should check it out. They have uh, not just Canada, uh, all around the world. Um, when the Europeans came, they moved westward and um, colonized the country of Canada and entered into a number of treaties. 
Um, further down the line, there was a pretty intense uh, assimilation program where they uh, had these residential schools where they took children out of our communities and stripped away the culture. Nick was mentioning he was part of the 60s scoop, which is a, a, another section of that. Um, so a pretty, pretty rough history. Uh, here's the Great Lakes. Um, Great Lakes are awesome. This is home for us, uh, the lifeblood of uh, the Anishinaabe people. Uh, big, big water. Uh, I looked up on Google last night, 22 quadrillion liters of fresh water, about 20% of the world's surface fresh water. Awesome, beautiful vistas, uh, awesome water, a great place to live and grow up. Uh, our nation is located on Lake Huron. It's, um, I'll just, I'll show you in a second. Um, that's the, tradi or the western way to look at the map with north as your top heading. This is a more of a traditional look. We would use the sun and the moon to navigate, so uh, the top being where the sun rises and bottom being where the sun sets. And then those are the Anishinaabe names of all the different Great Lakes. And oh yeah, also we have uh, critters on the outside that are native. Some are native, some are not, but those are uh, some of the non-human beings that uh, live in that system. So this is where we are. This is uh, uh, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. We're gonna be using a term SAN. Um, it just stands for Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. It's a collective of our First Nation, the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation, and our sister reserve, the Chippewas of Saugeen First Nation. And we've been in this territory since time immemorial. Our archeological record dates back some 10,000 years um, of continued occupancy and use of this territory. The darker, Green are the reserve lands, so uh, through treaties and whatnot, we've, de we've been pushed into these small reserves, but we never relinquished our rights to hunt and fish in our territory. Uh, and Nick mentioned he's a councillor member for, for Nawash. Uh, both of these reserves come together through something called Joint Council, and this Joint Council deliberates and makes decisions uh, throughout the territory and our fishery. Oh, that's kind of hard to see. If you look at the recording, and we can send some PDFs around, that's just a map of our treaties. We've, we've been included in a number of treaties, uh, surrendering land for protections from the Crown and the Crown uh, you know, not following through and allowing encroachment. It's been a, it's been pr a pretty rough history with uh, the country of Canada. That's a nice picture from our reserve right there with one of our bluffs. And then the next part is a video I took on my drone on our reserve. I don't know, do you want to say anything? I, there's no sound, so this is where we come from. So this, uh, this part of the video is showing what we call uh, prairie. Um, there's some very rare orchids that actually grow across in this section of the uh, landscape. In the background, you see uh, Hay Island, White Cloud Island, which was once a part of our reserve. You see, uh, that looks like Sacred Bluff in the very back one, and then the one just above the water tower here as it's flying up here is uh, known as Jones Bluff. As it pans around, you'll start to see Sydney Bay there. Um, that's known, that's where a lot of our folks uh, in our community, we start our fishing there in the springtime. Uh, when the suckers start to come in, our, our people uh, the elders in that used to live off suckers. That was the very first fish that they would get in the springtime um, to be able to provide substance and nutrition back into our, our people. So the prairie is very flat. Uh, it's changing, of course, and evolving as we go on. There's a, we've put a fish uh, compost dump in the one section of it so that our fishermen can start to replenish for fertilization. And Sydney Bay is now scoping over towards uh, Prairie Point, Melville Sound, and maybe we might even see Rabbit Island out there. I don't know why we call it Rabbit Island, but because it's full of seagulls and snakes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's panning over there. Oh, maybe over on your far right-hand corner there, you might see a little glimpse of it. It's hard to tell from this angle. That'll do. Sweet. Right on, and Nick was talking about Sydney Bay. Uh, we had some maple syrup we're giving around, and that's where the maple syrup was harvested. Oh, 
And then this is Ryan's bit. I'll pass it over. Yeah. All righty. So we're going to start with a little bit of some of the history. Alex already mentioned some of it, but uh, didn't really get too much into the fishery, which is really what we're here today to talk about. So if you uh, think back and were there when um, uh, settlers first came into the territory, we have oral history that tells us that at that time, the fishery was so rich that uh, you could walk across the backs of those fish. And uh, at that time, when settlers first came in, of course, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation uh, had um, sole control of the, the fishery, and there was all kinds of trade networks going throughout uh, Turtle Island, uh, bringing those fish for trade. And also at that time, of course, fish were uh, extremely important for um, on the cultural, ceremonial side of things. Um, for example, the clan system, some of the, the fish are represented in, as a dotum. Uh, for example, the, the uh, dickamag or the whitefish. Um, and of course, important for food. Um, now, when those settlers first came in, uh, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation actually leased out parts of the fishery to those first settlers so that they could have uh, some of the fish as well. Um, now the settlers weren't happy with the amount of fish that they, they didn't want a little bit, they wanted it all. So um, as time went on, uh, we saw the British North American Act and we saw the, um, the uh, Fisheries Act come into play and uh, they used that legislation to take away the fishery from the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Um, and the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation said, uh, hold on here, we never gave up any of that uh, fishery. We didn't, uh, any of, if you take a look at any of those treaties that Alex was mentioning, uh, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation always made sure that that fishery uh, wasn't given up because that was the means of uh, trade, food, ceremony, all those uh, really important things. So, of course, they didn't ever intend on giving that up. And uh, at that time, there was, um, uh, so the fishery had been pushed into just what we would say was a little postage stamp around each uh, First Nation that you saw on that map there. Uh, however, uh, a lot of the fishers would uh, sneak out of that, that boundary that the uh, government was trying to impose and go out and, and try and catch, catch those fish that they needed for all those important uh, things that we were talking about, um, and one of them got caught and charged. Uh, his name was, uh, he was known as Turtle, um, or Francis Najwan, and uh, so he decided that he was uh, going to fight those charges, so um, Turtle, along with the chief at the time, Howard Jones, uh, were taken to, to uh, court and charged with overfishing, um, and at that time, uh, there was a um, Justice Fairgrieve actually sided on the, the side of the Saugeen the Ojibwe Nation and reaffirmed that right to the commercial fishery, which resulted in what we call the jones Najuan decision, which is right here. That was in 1993. So that was the start of uh, the Saugeen the Ojibwe Nation resuming the, the fisheries out of that de court decision. So just a little bit about more about the fishery. So uh, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation have uh, the sole commercial fishery within the um, territory that you saw on the map Alex was sharing. Um, so what, what are we fishing for? Well, we're fishing for lake whitefish, lake trout, yellow perch, pickerel, and uh, to some extent, some of the ciscos in the past, chub, for example, were pretty important. Um, this fishery is a freshwater fishery. I'm sure it's very different from probably from what you're used to over here, I would imagine. Um, so we have two, we have different styles of vessels. So um, I'm gonna try this pointer, but to see if I can get it to work. Yeah, so this one here is what we call a punt. So it's a small open vessel. Um, and a lot of the fishers use these to, to harvest fish. And then uh, some of the larger commercial scale use what's called a, a Lake Erie style um, tug. So that's another style of boat that we see in the fishery. 
and then just a couple pictures of some of our fishers out uh, fishing. And this is uh, how Son catches fish for the most part as far as commercial, the commercial fishery is concerned and that's uh, a gill net so it's um, basically just a net that floats in the water and, and just tangles the fish up in the, the gills. And yeah, just a few pictures of some of those fish that we were talking about. So you can see the lake trout right here. There's one of the large lake white fish with some kind of uh, crazy guy in the back there. And uh, these, are, these are some of the uh, ciscos that we were talking about. Uh, we have the yellow perch. Um, and then, oh, some of the, some more ciscos here. And then of course the, uh, the uh, pickerel that we catch. So, just a little bit about the fisheries assessment program. That's where I came in. I got hired to run this fisheries program and, and uh, basically the idea was after that jones Nagewa decision in 1993, uh, chief and council uh, at that time, they decided that they needed to uh, set up a program to collect information about the fishery uh, with the idea that that would uh, help with sustainable, um, I guess, stewardship of the fishery. So that program was set up with the idea that uh, the assessment program would go out and collect information from the fishers. You know, we collect things like the amount of fish they caught and take samples from the individual fish. Um, and the program uh, was really set up in a Western science style of, um, fisheries uh, management, I'll call it. Um, it was felt at that time that uh, that was more or less uh, going to be the best way because we, we still had a lot of fights left with the um, colonial government as far as uh, a whole range of issues that still needed to be resolved that it was felt like uh, and probably quite valid that uh, Western science was the only thing that um, the colonial government was going to listen to, uh, and we needed to basically fight them with the same system they're using. Um, and we'll see that maybe our ideas changed a little bit as time went on, but you'll see as we get on. Um, so basically the job is to take that information from the fishery and, and bring that back to the uh, chief and council so that they can make informed decisions um, as time has moved on, we're also heavily involved in fish research uh, and there to support the, the fishers and, and the communities um, and also uh, have a role in uh, food security. So back uh, when, you know, COVID uh, happened, uh, there was a lot of concern about um, food security at that time, the Chippewas of Nawash actually um, tightly regulated uh, who was allowed to come in and out of the First Nation. Uh, there was roadblocks set up and uh, there was real strong concerns about the ability to keep getting food. And, she, and at the same time, the commercial fishers, um, most of the fish that they're catching is going into the restaurant industry. The restaurant industry was shut down after uh, when COVID uh, hit. Um, so they could go out and catch fish, but there was no one there to buy them. So um, Chief and Council made a really wise decision, in my opinion, and thought, okay, here's all these fishers that have fish that they can't sell. Here's all the membership, and, you know, we need to make sure that we take care of food security. And not only that, but um, fish is a medicine. So making sure that people stay healthy requires um, fish. So basically... Uh, chief and council went and hired the fishers to go out and collect those fish. We brought them back to um, the First Nation and those were distributed out to membership so that they could have fish. And actually, um, chief and council, we, we organized um, ferreting. We brought that fish all over, um, all over Ontario to the uh, Native Friendship Centers. Um, hundreds of pounds of fish basically to other First Nations all across Ontario. So we, uh, I guess Chief and Council were taking care of the other First Nations as well. Yeah. 
And then we're also involved in education. So where our office is, we're actually right across the street from the, um, the Chippewas of Neewa School. So sometimes we go over there and, and uh, bring some fish over and the kids love to play in the fish guts and learn how to fillet fish and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, everyone has a good time. And uh, at the end of the day, we send them all home with a fish and they go and have a nice fish to eat at, at home. So I'm just thinking back to the presentation that we heard uh, this morning, and I think one of the key messages that uh, I heard was this idea of um, trying to figure out what the why is, and um, that was really where we started as well, um, but it wasn't really, I don't feel like it was my job to uh, know what the why is. We had to go to membership and ask them what the why was, and that's really where we started. Um, so we, we held um, interviews, we had uh, feasts, and we tried to figure out from the membership the, really what the why was, uh, what, what did we need to do um, to address their concerns, and what did we need to um, research, what did we need to try and accomplish. And, and all of that culminated, uh, well, we, we ended up publishing it in a paper, but uh, that's probably not too... Uh, uh, probably not not the best way to communicate with membership. <laughs> they prefer other forms. But uh, if anybody here is interested, we do have uh, you, it is open. Ah, it is open access. Uh, oh, where did I go? Anyway, that QR code will take you. You're welcome to take a look at the article. Um, but that's really the place where we're still taking our direction from is those interviews and learning from membership, the kinds of stuff that we needed to look into, uh, as well as, uh, so the direction basically that we, we, we're taking on stewardship in, as well as uh, our research program. So not up to us, it's up to the membership. So just a few key concepts just to uh, help you understand so was the presentation from here on in. Um, so one of the concepts is sod-based ecological knowledge. Uh, this is just a sod-specific, essentially, uh, indigenous knowledge. So we think about uh, that connection that the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation have to those fish since time immemorial. And over that period of time, uh, that relationship with the fish results in a, a really long-term understanding of what those fish are up to. And, uh, I think was we heard this morning about this idea that that knowledge adapts and evolves and the same thing is happening with the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. So that information isn't static, it, it's continuing, people are continuing to learn as the environment changes, things change and people notice those things and pass that down generation to generation, um, typically through um, oral, like basically out, out on the land, out on the water. Uh, passing it down from generation to generation. Um, and then uh, the concept of two-eyed seeing. So uh, two-eyed seeing is something that uh, we started using uh, because we were trying to um, move away solely from that Western science way of, of uh, doing research and doing stewardship. We were trying to... Um, use a more holistic approach that used uh, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation knowledge as well as Western science. And at the time, we were struggling. We didn't know how, how to actually do that. Um, and at the time, it didn't really feel like, um, from what we could see, that there was too many um, paths out, out there that others were doing that we could follow. But one of the things we saw was this concept of two-eyed seeing that was developed by uh, Elder Dr. Albert Marshall um, from, from the Mi'kmaq. And uh, the idea was that um, with two-eyed seeing is that uh, you need basically both eyes to see. So if you're, and Alex told me to use a concept that uh, probably would go, be a little more understandable here in New Zealand, so we'll use rugby, I guess. Uh, so. <laughs> If you try and play rugby with, with one eye covered, uh, if you're not used to that, you're probably going to have a little trouble with depth perception. 
Um, and uh, so you really need both eyes. And with the idea that one of those eyes is Western science and the other eye is um, indigenous knowledge. So this idea that you need both of those eyes if you're gonna get a really good understanding about what's going on in the environment, um, all those questions that we had, those whys, um, we, could, we could answer them solely through um, indigenous knowledge. We could probably answer them solely through Western science, but we might only have a, a really a partial answer to those questions and we're probably gonna get a better understanding if we put our heads together and, and work together. So that's where that whole idea came from. And the idea that um, all the, anything we're doing is starting with the membership. Um, there's no point in us doing a whole bunch of research on something we're interested in that has no purpose um, outside of our own personal interests. So it's got, it's got to come from the membership and we seek guidance from them, you know, on a regular basis so that we're making sure to follow along with that process in a good way that is in the direction that they want us to uh, take. Um, and this idea about nothing about us without us. So again, no point in going and doing something just because we're interested in it. We're doing it for membership. And then we have this whole idea about these two different knowledge systems. So we have um, sod based ecological knowledge and we have Western science. Uh, and there's some differences between these two um, knowledge systems. Um, and I'm not going to go into these in detail because uh, we probably would be running out of time here. But uh, just at a high level, just the idea that um, sod ecological knowledge tends to be more holistic. Uh, whereas when you look at a Western science approach, it's a very reductionist, trying to separate things out into little pieces and understand those little pieces um, and then there's also some, some similarities between the, between the two knowledge systems as well. So there are differences, but there's similarities as well. Um, so both are, you know, both are uh, completely valid and uh, ways of knowing, just a different way of learning, different way of doing things, but we still gain important information, obviously, from both knowledge systems. But Western science hasn't had a, a good track record of placing a whole lot of value on, on the sod ecological knowledge and a, or indigenous knowledge in general, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, yeah, enough said about that. <laughs> well, why, do we, why would we want to use two-eyed seeing? Well, if anybody, I don't know, I, I hear that you have a lot of the same kinds of issues that we have, uh, that we're facing. We're facing all the things, uh, climate change, um, invasive species, um, all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, why would we want to use two-eyed seeing? Well, we figure that um, the current way of doing things isn't really working out too well. If you take a look at the environment with all these problems, uh, obviously there's something wrong there. Um, and so the idea of two-eyed two seeing means that if we put our, both, eye, both these eyes together, maybe we can come up with some of the solutions that are needed to all these problems that are happening. And uh, that's really where that whole idea comes from. And not only that, but um, it's really a source of inventiveness to, and a way to innovate and learn from each other and create new ideas and new ways of doing things and not be stuck in uh, just one kind of uh, stream of thought. It's good to hear other perspectives. So like I said, we got all kinds of bad stuff going on in the Great Lakes fisheries, unfortunately. Um, invasive species are, are one of them. And uh, it, it's kind of a sad story, really. I won't go too much into detail, but you can see we're kind of uh, in this area right here. So the, the fishery in, in the Great Lakes um, that SOD relies on um, has crashed. Uh, we've gone from, uh, when I first started in 2008, there was a little place called Howdenvale, 
And in the fall, it would be a little, um, like a little temporary village where all the uh, membership were gathering to go fishing. And there were people um, going out in boats um, basically all day and all night long to go out and catch those fish during that time. There'd be people on shore that would be um, uh, gutting the fish and, and packing them uh, up and, and all of that kind of stuff. And it was very, very uh, thriving uh, little uh, kind of temporary village that would come at that time. Now if you go there in the fall, you're, there's nobody there. It's empty in that short of time because of that fisheries largely gone. And why is that? It's because of a lot of these invasive species, a, a lot of climate change, um, fish stocking, the list goes on. Fishery hasn't had, the, the uh, commercial fishery um, has not really had a big role in that decline. It's all these other environmental factors, unfortunately. Thanks, Ryan. So yeah, pretty dire state in our fishery, which is unfortunate coming from a, a time of plenty to a time of scarcity. And it's, it's had some really, really rough impacts on, 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 the, on our people and who we are. Uh, based on that, the beginning slide Ryan had with that uh, initial work we did with workshops and interviews, uh, our communities identified a need to do something about our Lake Whitefish. Lake Whitefish for our people are our fish. They're the cultural keystone. They're very important. They comprise the majority of our commercial and subsistence harvest. Uh, so with that, with that direct need raised by our community members, we, um, we, we started a research initiative. So this research initiative is called Together with Gigoyuk. Gigoyuk in Ojibwe or Anishinaabe Moen is fishes. So Together with Fishes. Uh, we're having a workshop tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. Um, where we're gonna play a documentary about this research program and one of our local artists created this logo and each little piece has a symbolic meaning and she goes through each one, it, it's pretty wicked, but one of the one things I will explain, the three heads in the middle represent the partners. So we partnered with the province of Ontario through their natural resources program. Um, the one in the middle is us, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, and then the one on the right um, would be the federal government through Parks Canada. And as you can see, we're, we're all sharing eyes there in this concept of two-eyed seeing and shared perspectives. Um, yeah, it's been really cool. It's not done yet. I think it, this, this research initiative finishes last year and there's a number of specific research projects embedded within this research initiative. Um, we're also talking, we got invited to do another talk tomorrow as well. Uh, this is a lovely gra or graphic uh, symbol thing that uh, Nick made. Um, the wheel we call it, and it's essentially a framework for doing this work that's grounded in our Anishinaabe Ojibwe culture. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want to say anything. Yeah, he's going to say something. This wheel is a combination of many teachings that uh, my father passed down to me and my uncles, um, and even our elders that. Uh, that taught me to fish and our ancestors that have passed on. Um, it's ironic that in 2006, our former chief, Ralph Ackwins, he was over here speaking on fishing. And, uh, you know, I, I look to our mentor, um, Mr. Uh, Stick, Marshall Najwan, who uh, passed away a couple of years ago and was uh, gracious enough to pass this on to me after he passed, so I carry his spirit with me all the time. One of the biggest things that I learned this morning in, in listening to the, the lady that spoke this morning and, and talking about it being circular is we were trying to put this into our teachings and incorporate it into our, our knowledge system. And we don't do anything without starting off with ceremony first. And even in this conference, we op this ceremony was opened, it was opened up with a good ceremony in a good way to open our hearts and our minds and to walk in parallel with our ancestors. Through that, we're able to build that trust with one another and to be able to start to learn how to walk with nature. Um, in, the other, in the black part of the circle there, and unfortunately my eyes aren't that good anymore, the formation of guiding principles. 
unless we have guiding principles, we're not going to be able to be able to put our, what our knowledge is and what the research is that we're trying to get through to understand what is going on with the mother nature and responsibility. We have a responsibility not only to ourselves as the, as the lowest human beings as we are in, in that big chain of, of the great laws and the natural laws. We have a responsibility to mother nature. We have a responsibility to the waters. We have a responsibility to the air, the earth, and the fire that, that gives us new life. Because without any of those, we, we, don't, we don't exist ourselves. Once we have all that, we have awareness of what it is that we are seeing. What it is that we're, what is going on? How, what is it that we are aware of? In that, and the accountability to being able to understand that and to hopefully reconnect that relationship with whether it's the birds, the trees, the rocks, the water. We have a responsibility and accountability to that. We also have uh, to recognize that there's multiple ways of knowledge. I, again, I'm, I'm not a school person. I, I live on the land as much as I can. I've learned from my elders and from my relatives. I've learned from um, my nephew here. His, he, he goes through his PhD. I actually learned quite a bit from him. Um, and it's encouraging our young ones to look at what it is and how they can incorporate the traditional knowledge systems into their PhDs to be able to carry that message forward into the future. I know that it says SON knowledge and Western science approaches. That's for the projects that we've been working on. Throughout the projects that Alex and Ryan have been working on in our communities, it's showing the Ministry of Natural Resources information that they said didn't exist. When it looked at the, uh, the fish and, and how they were eating and what was happening in those waters, they would say, those fish don't eat, they're not carnivorous, they're salad eaters. They only eat seafood, the plants. And I'd say that's why God gave them, or the Creator gave them all those sharp teeth, is so they could cut up their salad. <laughs> in recent months, they've done some studies, uh, and they're still continuing to do those studies, and they're finding out that what we've been saying for 20 years is starting to show that those fish that they're introducing into the Great Lakes are actually killing the natural fish. So we have a long ways to go. We have shared and meaningful goals as, as First Nations people and as uh, non-Indigenous people. We, we have to come together and we have to have that ongoing learning and engagement for one another and understanding again back to mother nature. We have to make sure that uh, we're place-based and issue focused when it's coming to what it is that we're looking at because certain things mean different things. Certain areas are where those fish spawn. Certain areas of the water are the nursery to those fish. When they go out to the deep, they come back again and they start to bring that circle of life back together again. And I, and I see that I've got shared and meaningful goals again there. Again, after all of that, is, um, this is the wrong wheel. I, I notice that now. I apologize about that because I do have uh, three or four copies of this wheel that I've started to develop. And I'm starting to look at other wheels right now for fish habitats and everything. If we look at the blue circle that encompasses everything, it's the great law. It's stuff that we can't change. It's what the creator has given us. And on the bottom is the natural law. Those are things that we can change. 
and we can help to develop. But understanding that uh, we don't want to change to the point of where it's going to start to affect that great law. And in the center of that wheel is what I like to call the ethical space. It's the space where we can talk to the governments, nation to nation. We're not always going to agree to disagree. But coming to an understanding and to again to walk in parallel. And I know that uh, I think we're speaking again tomorrow, again. Um, and Alex has said that we've got another workshop. And I might dive into this a little bit deeper. In fact, I might actually sit down tonight and develop some new wheels um, based on the teachings in it and see if I can put something together for tomorrow as well. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Alex. Thank you. Miigwech, Nick. All right. For the sake of time, maybe we'll scoot along here. Um, I introduced this together with Gigo Yuck Research Initiative and said there's some research projects embedded within it. The foundation of that is this, um, these interviews we hold with knowledge holders, past and present fish harvesters, Nick, um, and uh, we, we sit down, we have this big map of the territory in front of us and we just ask them questions specific to Lake Whitefish. Uh, we map important cultural spots um, and it's, it's, really, it's really awesome, it's super engaging. We, get to document this knowledge and keep it within the community for future generations, uh, super rewarding. And this informs all of the other different research projects that I'm about to talk about. But where this came from was my master's research. Uh, so I did this a while ago. Um, there was some concern from the community about this group of fish named Cisco's. They were once super, super important to the fishery, especially right after we got the rights back after the court case. However, uh, in the late 2000s, they pretty much disappeared from our commercial fishery. So folks were concerned and um, I found this way of mapping knowledge. Uh, I didn't reinvent the wheel, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, but uh, we made some really awesome maps and went out and got to sample for these fish and found them. And for some of the fish harvesters I worked with, it was the first time they saw these fish in about like 15 years, so super big. And it's good to know they're out there and now we can, uh, we can do things to, to help their populations into the future. So that, that's the basis of this mapping indigenous knowledge stuff. And we've interviewed, I don't know, like 60. 60 plus the 20 I did. So lots of folks, lots of knowledge, really great knowledge. Um, and then there's just the paper I wrote, um, but I'll, I'll skip along. Another aspect of this together with Gigo Yuck Initiative is acoustic telemetry. Um, so acoustic telemetry, essentially you uh, surgically insert this little receiver into a uh, fish's body cavity um, and then they go out into the lake and they swim around and then these, um, um, oh sorry, the tag, we insert the tag in the fish and the receivers sit at the bottom of the lake. So uh, we covered the whole entire Lake Huron and Georgia Bay bottom with these uh, receivers to pick up signals of fish which was the first time it happened in Lake Huron and we, we helped to initiate that work which was really cool. and. We've tagged somewhere around 500 or so individual lake trout and lake whitefish, and we have about four years of data to show where they move. And funny enough, what our fishermen have told us in the interviews is exactly what we see with this uh, science. I mean, who would have thought, eh? But it, it, it's great for out in the deep as well, and then we've partnered with a number of other First Nations as well, and it's just a really cool collaborative project that we'll probably be working on for a long time. Um, this is at the beginning of the Together with Gigo Yuck initiative when we did the first round of acoustic telemetry. Um, Nick and Ryan talked about ceremony. We have one of our elders in the top right, Justin Johnson, doing a traditional pipe ceremony to, to start us off in a good way. And you know, in, in science, you're talking about ethical reviews and getting permission to interview people. And this is our form of ethical review. You know, he spoke to the fish, told them what we're doing, why we're doing them, why we're, we're doing what we're doing. And, and, and in all our work as well, we hire local fish harvesters. So in the middle, we have a fishing family. Uh, Pete Thede and his kids went out and caught our first uh, batch of fish for this acoustic telemetry. So really cool stuff. Get to see a lot of fish, which is always fun. And then another part, uh, we're doing a bunch of assessments. So habitat, shoal, larval assessment. We've been deploying uh, underwater remotely operated vehicles to get an accurate depiction of what some of these spawning reefs or shoals look like underneath the water. We have some idea from, from our elders and fishermen what the status of them, what the status of these different habitats are, but it's, it's, uh, it's awesome to pair that with, you know, imagery 
um, just to see what's going on. And you know, these habitats are super impacted by some of the invasive species, but I won't get too much more into it. That's my little sister in the middle there, Ruth Duncan, or as I like to call her, Little Ruth, um, a budding aquatic fisheries scientist. Uh, and then I'm just going to pass it back to Ryan. I think we're at 45 minutes, but we're not getting the yank, so. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Uh, so continuing on in that vein of uh, trying to figure out some of these uh, whys that we're hearing for uh, these questions uh, that we're hearing from uh, membership, and uh, one of the things that we heard was um, a strong concern from membership about the stocking of lake trout and the, the interactions between those lake trout and lake whitefish. So what we did is we, we ended up getting some funding to look into that. And again, we use that two-eyed seeing approach that pairs Saugeen Ojibwe Nation knowledge as well as Western science. So. Um, in that project on the uh, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation side, uh, knowledge side of things, we went and did those uh, knowledge interviews, we did mapping and recorded all of that so that we could uh, draw upon that to get a good understanding of what Saugeen knew about uh, those interactions. And then on the Western science side of things, we went out and caught, caught a bunch of fish and uh, we took their stomachs and we looked to see what they were eating. And we also did some stable isotopes work to, to see what was going on. And, um, and we, we gained a, a much better understanding about what was going on in, the, in the, the food web out of the ecosystem there and who was eating what. And um, funnily enough, uh, again, we had been hearing from our, our fishers that they were so concerned that um, those lake trout were really having a, an impact on lake whitefish. And the Western scientists had been saying that those two fish don't have anything to do with each other. Uh, as Nick said, there was um, th those uh, teeth there were for grinding up salad. Um, and of course, we, we did learn um, that there were a lot of interactions going on. Uh, these lake trout, um, do, do eat lake whitefish, uh, it's not sole diet, but they certainly do eat lake whitefish. And importantly, they, they actually, we found out that um, those lake whitefish that um, used to eat little uh, uh, bugs basically in the, in, on the bottom of the lake, um, well, when the, when the mussels came in, they were brought in, in ballast water, those mussels carpeted the bottom of the, the lake so those uh, whitefish couldn't eat those uh, little bugs on the bottom anymore because they were gone, taken out by the mussels. So uh, the whitefish had moved on to mussels and then from there we found out that they had moved on to eating um, fish. So they went from being bug eaters to mussel eaters to eating fish. And uh, those same fish that the whitefish were eating uh, was the same thing that uh, all these uh, exotic fish we're eating as well. So um, the salmon that were brought in from the Pacific, uh, as well as the lake trout, we're eating the same thing. So there were interactions going on. Everything's uh, trying to eat the same food. So out of that, we had a, a paper that describes some of the work that we did. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it, it was hard to find a way to work together with um, the colonial government because uh, for many, many years um, we talked about that history of the fishery and how the settlers uh, took control of that fishery. And uh, even after that court case in 1993, the colonial government wasn't all that happy about the result of that. And they weren't too uh, keen on relinquishing the power that they had um, over the fishery. So it's been an ongoing battle to try and uh, gain more and more, I guess, decision-making and jur jurisdiction back over the fishery. So it's, a, it's an uphill battle. And um, we use two-eyed seeing as, as a way to try and, uh, try and move past some of that historical stuff and look into the future and try and work towards a better future. Hmm? Oh. 
And uh, Alex says we're over, but uh, if nobody tells me to get down, I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, so uh, in addition to that, like I said, we're, we're trying to address fish stocking in general. So um, again, we're using the same kind of uh, two-eyed seeing approach to try and figure out this whole fish stocking thing. And uh, we're, we're getting closer to being able to address that issue as well with that two-eyed seeing approach. Um, oh, we've had no shortage of challenges. Um, everything from uh, trying to figure out how we can do ethical research with membership, um, to trying to figure out how we're gonna uh, resolve these different knowledge systems with different sources of uh, knowledge and how we can move past that. And, I, and just on that, I wanted to say that that two-eyed seeing approach is not with the idea of um, integrating these two knowledge systems. They stay separate. I, I think that, um, you know, when I think about integrating, it kind of seems um, maybe a little too close to assimilation, um, to me anyway, and a little bit of concern about that. So we, we keep those two knowledge systems separate. Uh, we just learn from each knowledge system what each knowledge system has to say. Um, one knowledge system might say something totally different than the other knowledge system. That's okay. That we can use that to learn and figure out why that might be. Doesn't mean either one is wrong, it's just a different perspective, a way of looking at things. Um, so this idea of moving beyond just recognition and, and trying to get some decision-making power because uh, that's a, like I said, that's a really hard thing to get. Everyone wants to make those decisions. They don't really want um, SON or indigenous nations usually having anything to do with decisions. Um, and of course, uh, Western science still tends to discount indigenous knowledge in Saudi K. And then of course we get into some of the politics and trying to figure out the, uh, the political as well as the technical side of things. Um, so looking into the future, uh, well, uh, one of the things we heard from membership is they didn't want another report that was going to gather dust on a shelf. Uh, we actually have to do something. Um, so that's really our next step is we're trying to use the information that we've learned uh, to try and uh, make things a little bit better for those dickamag or the whitefish. And that's really where we're moving on to next. Um, and this idea of uh, moving into that decision-making capacity and not just being uh, left on the sidelines. And of course, we'll keep doing research as we go. So, Chi Miigwech, uh, many thanks to everyone for listening to us. And uh, sorry if we went over time, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs>